Do you have what it takes to be a lumberjack? Now, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, most of the trees here in Wisconsin were actually harvested to support the growing populations in places like St. Louis and Chicago. And all the white pine that almost covered the entire state of Wisconsin was all cut down for lumber. And so this is kind of taking a look at the different jobs that there were in a lumberjack camp. And we'll take a look at some of the different tools as well. Now, here's our home. Our home has a bunch of different buildings in it um, that are all made of lumber that were um, probably trees harvested right from there. There's a whole bunch of guys in there and also some animals. And this is my lumberjack crew and they look so happy to be here, of course. Um, they love working for me. But when you look at their faces, they all have like kind of grumpy faces or, or faces that don't look very happy to be there. And that is because cameras weren't the same as they were uh, as they are now. Cameras were um, very big, very bulky, and you had to have the shutter open a long time. And so they couldn't sm hold that smile for too long. Also, because lumberjacks want to look tough and mean, and not mean, but like tough, like they're good, they're all men too. If you notice, there's no women in that picture. Lumberjack camp wasn't a place for most women, although sometimes there could be a cook or the cook's wife um, that would be allowed on camp. But we're all men, and we're all we're all tough. So breakfast is at 4 a.m. You might hear do, 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 roll out, daylight in the swamp, something like that to get you out of bed. And you're eating breakfast at 4 in the morning. And so the people that cook your breakfast are the cook and the cookie. And they may, might use things like a pot and a wooden spoon. And they're going to be chopping up some vegetables maybe. You might have some grits or some mash or some oatmeal in the morning. And, uh, and then you're going to you know, fill your tummy a little bit. And then you're heading out in the dark. So you're going to leave camp in the dark. And you're going to walk all the way out to the point where you're going to be starting to cut down the trees. So walking through the areas that you cut down um, before. So we walk out to the forest in the dark so that when it's daylight, we're ready. We can see we're ready to start felling trees. And that's our first job. The first job um, is actually the job of a fitter. And the fitter is going to be using a, uh, an axe just like this. And they start to put a notch or a wedge in one side of the tree, just like that. And actually, they want to put the notch on the side of the tree that the tree is going to fall. And so sometimes they work in tandem, meaning that they work together. And they want to create this, this notch in the tree as kind of a weak point. Now, some of these trees that got really big um, could fit eight guys in the notch that the fitters were chopping into the trunk of the tree. And this one has these big buttress roots. Neither of these trees are from Wisconsin, but lumberjacks in other states had other problems about like with these buttress roots. So they had to build scaffolding to get them up high enough to be able to do their job. Um, and after the fitters put the notch in, next came the fellers. And the fellers do something like this. It's a cross-cut saw. And so there'd be two people, one on either side, and they would each pull the saw back to them and then pull the saw back and then pull the saw back and then pull the saw back. And the saw teeth would actually cut through. And so as they started um, cutting through, they would get a good rhythm going. And um, when the tree started to crack, you'd hear timber and then the tree would land on the ground and so after the tree was felt on the ground now we have the swampers come now the swampers would use smaller saws to kind of saw off some of the branches um, and they'd also use this tool right here called a bark spud and so the bark spud tool was really important for trying to get some of that loose bark off we're, we're really what we're doing is trying to prepare the tree to be moved out of the woods uh, and so we also don't want to haul an entire tree, so we'd have the job of the buckers, who also would have a, an axe, and they would go and they would chop, uh, measure out, first of all, measure an 8-foot saw log, sometimes a 16-foot saw log, and they would measure out exactly that 8-foot mark or 16-foot mark, and then they would put a, a chop mark in there. And that would make sure that all the logs are the same size, which is going to be way easier to haul them if they're all the same size than if you're hauling big trees through the woods. Then the sawyers would come behind the, the sawyers, not sawyer, the sawyers would come behind the buckers 
again using a cross cut saw and they would saw through the booker's top mark and now we have logs. Instead of having a big 100 foot tree on the ground, now we have actual logs that we'll be able to move. All right, we also have a dentist in our camp, but our dentist does not care about what your teeth look like. He actually cares about what the saw teeth look like. And so he uses a tool that looks a little bit like this. Um, it's called a saw pliers to fix any of the saw teeth that might have gotten bent or dull um, while working that day. So all of the lumberjacks are gonna work until from light uh, sun up until noon and at noon we have a little bit of a break so that we can eat our lunch but we're not going to hike all the way back to the camp for lunch and so thankfully there is the job of the cookie and the cookie is the person who has all of our food and all of the um the uh, plates and cups and things in a big backpack and he takes the kettle and once it comes off, and a lot of times it's like an all-in-one meal, like a stew or maybe some, some bread or some biscuits that go along with it. He takes it off the fire and then has to get it out as fast as he can to where the lumberjacks are working because there's nothing that lumberjacks like worse than cold food. And so we want to keep our lumberjacks happy. So we'll make sure that they're happy lumberjacks by getting them some hot lunch. And so there we are, we don't want to mess with the lumberjack's lunch. You can see that they've got a little piece of crust, of, like a bread um, right there, maybe a little bit of a sandwich. Um, this guy has maybe some coffee or some tea. So lunch and then we're gonna get back to work. So now it's time to move those logs. And take a look at this. This is one sleigh, all these logs, two horses, four guys at the very tip top. How do you think we move those logs? Well, not like that, that's for sure. In fact, this is what we call a star load. And star loads were interesting because lumberjacks would put together a star load when a photographer from a newspaper would come to the camp. And since there weren't, um, you know, wasn't the internet, you could just search out or Photoshop things. This was a real load that they put together, but it wasn't actually a load that they would move through the woods. They just put it together so that the photographer could take a picture of it and people would be so impressed with our lumberjack camp. They would put out their best looking horses and their most handsome men on those loads and they called them a star load. But really, the way that we're gonna move those are, are, is using animals and good roads. There's a job called the bull whacker. And the bull whacker's job was to use oxen and to put a yoke around those oxen and to be able to um, skid those logs out of the forest. We also had high pounders. High pounders worked with horses. And as they worked with the horses, they would also be responsible for not only training the horses, but caring for them as well. So if you're a bull whacker or a high pounder, you're not gonna hit your animal uh, at all. You're gonna be training your animal and taking care of them, including feeding them and brushing them and cleaning up after them too. The next jobs are the skyver and the chainers. So once the horses and the, cat, the oxen skid the logs out to one of our main roads, now it's time to load them up onto the sleigh. But how do we take an eight foot log and put them up on the sleigh? Well, we're gonna use some simple machines. And we can see right here, it almost looks like a ramp. Another word for a ramp is an inclined plane. We're also gonna be using things like pulleys and things like levers to help us. One of the levers that lumberjacks use often was called a cant hook. So this is a simple machine that allows us to um, put this hook over the log, pull down on the lever, and it lifts the log right up. And the skybird's job was to lift the log up. The chainer's job was to take the chain and put the chain around the log. And then they used some pulleys and the inclined plane, and they would hoist the log right up onto the sleigh.
very dark. The skybird also had to have really good balance because he was trying to make sure that the logs were positioned perfectly on the sled so the sled wasn't going to fall over one side or the other. That would be dangerous. But really, how can the horses pull the weight of all those logs, even though this isn't a star load, it certainly is a big load. And the answer is really good roads. So there was um, a, a guy or a contraption called a sprinkler. And it worked just like this. It worked to sprinkle water, just like a Zamboni would cover an ice rink with a thin layer of water, then it would freeze and so it becomes very slick. So we take out the friction part of it all and um, the sleds were able to move really well. The con man was the guy who loaded the water, so he would have to go to the river or a local lake, fill up some barrels, and then load them into the sprinkler or the Zamboni. And then we'd have a groover, and the groover had a track system, kind of like a bobsled or like cross-country ski tracks, and you would actually cut grooves into that ice because we don't want those sleds just going all over the place or those sleighs going all over the place. We want them set in a track. Think of it kind of as a reverse train track system. And then we needed to make sure that our roads were cleared. So anytime that there were things like branches in the road or pine cones in the road or too many pine needles in the road, we get these road monkeys. And these road monkeys were guys that would ride up with the, the guy who was steering the horses, driving the horses, and they'd say, road monkey, clear the road. And he'd have to jump off and move some of the branches. This person had to be very fast, very nimble, very quick. So what happens when you get really slippery roads um, and you're easy going and it's, the horses don't have to work too hard um, to be able to pull those sleds, but you get to a downhill. Now you don't want fast roads at all. We need a way to slow those sleighs down so they don't run over the back of our horses. So the way that we do that is by sprinkling hay on the downhill slopes. That adds friction to the road and will actually give the horses some traction and then slow the, the sleigh um, down, which is important. And then we have this guy right here. And we call him the chickadee. That's the name of his job. He looks super happy to be doing his job, right? Well, the job of the chickadee is to clean up after all those oxen and those uh, and those horses. We call it we call it cleaning up a whole bunch of apple pies. Since horses make horse apples and cows make cow pies, somebody's got to clean them, clean up the road. So the horses and the oxen, they got us out of the woods. We're off to the main road, but how are we supposed to get all of this lumber down to places like Madison, Milwaukee, Chicago, and St. Louis? And the answer is this. Can you tell what it is from this map? It's the river system. Rivers are great because the water moves um, all the time. It flows with the elevation of the land. It flows downhill. It doesn't use any energy to flow downhill. You don't have to feed it or clean up after it or brush it or train it. And um, logs float. And so it's a great way to be able to move those logs. But let's say that I'm putting my logs in at my lumberjack camp just down river from somebody else's lumberjack camp on another part of the river upstream. How does the sawmill know which logs came from my lumberjack camp? And that's where the marker comes in. So if you were a marker at the lumberjack camp, you would use a big metal hammer and you would actually put a mark, sort of our initials or our logo, into the ends of the log. That way they would know who's, who to be able to pay for, for those logs. And we had the landing men and the decker. Now they were right at the shores of the river or if the river was frozen over, you would actually deck the logs right on that frozen river. So the tool you would use for decking or stacking the logs would be that cant hook again. And the landing men would use a clipboard and write down how many logs they were sending downstream, maybe what type of tree they were and how much they expected to get for those logs. And then there was another job. It's a really important job, and it's a really dangerous job. It was the river pig. Now the river pig's job was to escort the logs from our lumberjack camp all the way to the sawmill. Because sometimes there would be rapids to go through, there would be twists and turns, and the logs would get stuck. So they'd use big long poles called pipe poles, and they'd use a special type of cant hook that had a spear at the end, and they called that a peavey. And so most of the time the river moved the logs and everything was going really, really well. And then sometimes 
They got all um, jammed up on the river and to the point where you needed to use some dynamite. So this was usually a last, re last course result because we didn't want to blow up our logs, right? And so if you've got your jam, the log jam and nothing is moving, you've got to blow it out and get that water flowing again. And as you can see in the early 1900s, our rivers were wall to wall logs that were going to the sawmill to be lumber for things like stores and warehouses and people's homes. And so whew, we made it to the sawmill. Um, we've got a, a wonderful diorama of a sawmill that we'll show you in a follow-up video. And then back at our camp, um, the stew bum was another person at our camp and his job was to make us a really big supper meal. Things like doorknob biscuits that were really hard on the outside and things like firecracker beans. And if you know that little thing about beans, beans the musical fruit, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And, um, and some salt pork and molasses and things like that. So really good big meal. And then after the day of work, there were still a bunch of chores to do, especially for you high pounders and you bull whackers. And so the horse and the cattle chores were really important. You never put your horse um, to bed wet or sweaty. You want to make sure that they're all the way dry, that they have green and hay and fresh water to drink. And then you can go and dry your socks because you probably only have one or two pairs of socks and you got to take really good care of your feet. So you're going to hang up those socks right on hooks right by your bed and I don't know about you but the end of a day that I'm working hard and I'm working outside my socks do not smell like I would want them right by my bed and you also want to flip your mattress see our mattresses are made out of straw and hemlock boughs and sometimes there can be body lice and ticks and fleas and stuff that live in our mattresses like to chew on our skin at night so if you flip your mattress over then it takes all night for those little creepy crawlies to come crawling up back to you and try to bite you in the nighttime. And then finally, we can have a break. And so what we do for our break is sometimes we'll play cards, but no gambling is allowed. And then we'll just tell stories. Um, on Sunday will be our day off. And so someone will volunteer to give the other men shaves and haircuts. It's also a day that we do our laundry. And so laundry, um, we just basically put some lye in some boiling water and paddle your clothes around. And, um, and that was a lumberjack camp. That was then. And this was actually a picture of some lumberjacks, uh, the lumberjack camp over by Rosholt, which is just uh, east of Stevens Point. And it left most of Wisconsin looking like this. So we have very few old growth forests left. Most of the forests that we have in Wisconsin are actually a secondary growth forest, meaning that after the 1900s and the lumberjacks came through, sometimes they were farmed, um, then those forests regenerated after that. There wasn't the thought where if you cut a tree down, you should plant a new one or manage for sustainability long term. But that's what we do now. And we have lumberjacks that come um, here to Boston School Forest, although we don't call them lumberjacks anymore. We call them loggers. And we work with loggers and foresters, people who are interested in managing the forest, for both taking some trees out for lumber and paper and also maintaining a habitat for wildlife as well. And so this is our our harvester and how our harvester here at Boston School of Forest has taken down a tree.
Well, thanks so much for watching our Lumberjack presentation in Wisconsin Forest History. We'll be touring our sawmill diorama and our Lumberjack cabin next.